Hi, I'm Sarah Solis, director of SAR Press, and I want to welcome all of you to SAR Press Editors Conversations, a new digital series in which I invite editors who are overseeing innovative projects at other presses to come and share their work with our alumni audience, as well as anyone else who's interested in writing and publishing. Today we have Katie Stileman of PUP Speaks, a new in-house speakers agency at Princeton University Press that works with authors to develop global speaking platforms. As we talk, I want to remind everyone in the audience to type all of your questions into the Q&A and I'll share them as we go. And before we jump into the conversation, I am going to ask my guest to briefly introduce herself, her press and her work. Katie? Thanks so much, Sarah. And good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, good evening for me. I'm actually uh, ringing in from London this evening. Um, if I moved my camera just a bit to the left, you'd see the BT Tower lit up just outside my window. Um, as Sarah says, uh, my name is Katie. Um, I'm now full time at Princeton University Press. Uh, not too long ago, I was uh, consulting. And uh, before that, I was working at MIT Press. Uh, and Oxford University Press before that. Um, and I'm currently overseeing an exciting new project called PUP Speaks, and we'll talk more about that as the evening progresses. So over the last few years, um, I think we've all been <clears throat> increasingly focused on outreach and the question of how we as publishers can get, can better get our author's work into readers' hands, but also reach well beyond our usual audiences. Um, whether we're talking about audiobooks, podcasts, blogs, magazines, um, other kinds of popular media, why do you think it's so important for academic presses in particular to reach a wider audience? And what do our authors um, have to offer? That's a very good question, Sarah. I should say uh, for a bit of additional background that before I was running PUP Speaks, I was a publicist and before that I was in marketing. Uh, so I've seen quite a few sides of the academic publishing promotions uh, of world. Um, and I think uh, there, are there are lots of reasons why um, our authors should be out there. Um, the number one, isn't it, is they know what they're talking about. Um, so academics are experts. Um, they spend uh, many years, sometimes uh, the majority of their lives, understanding topics, topics that are nuanced, multifaceted, complex, um, that have many different implications and that are changing all the time. Um, we sometimes uh, don't like using the word expert. It's got a bit of a bad name. Uh, and sometimes there are negative associations around the ivory tower. But I don't think anyone would argue that um, lots of the authors we work with are the people who understand complex phenomena best, whether that's a particular set of uh, scientific principles uh, or how COVID-19 spread across the world and tore our lives apart. Um, importantly, they're also often the most up to date. Uh, very often I'll watch uh, news reports about topics um, that my authors are experts in. And I will know um, that those news reporters don't have the best information because lots of fields, uh, particularly some of the ones that have the biggest impact on our lives, change really fast and it is the full-time job of an academic to stay up to date in their field. Um, another reason um, is that academics are underappreciated. Uh, so um, very often that's our fault, isn't it, as academic publishers and um, other people involved uh, in the promotion of academic research. We, we think it is uh, too complex for lots of people to understand, perhaps even too obscure, too niche to be of relevance. But actually, uh, many academics are extremely good at communicating complex ideas uh, with broad audiences. Um, and, and finally, I think they're often overlooked as a really valuable resource. Um, so a really great example of that, I think, is um, when we are working um, with PUP Speaks to find uh, an after dinner speaker uh, or a guest speaker at a big business conference. People often don't think about academics because they assume they're too busy or they don't understand how their pay structures work. And they might end up going and asking someone who... Uh, for example, um, has a business background to talk about some complex economics that they don't really understand. So we uh, are making it our job um, to make it clear that academics are really useful resources that not only can be used, but also should be used much more than they are. 
Um, so as you say, you know, sometimes it's really challenging to sort of bridge that divide between academia and, you know, the wider world. Um, and it sounds like that's where PUP Speaks come in, comes in. Um, so could you tell me a little bit more about that and, you know, how it developed and, and what exactly it is that you all are doing? Absolutely. And Sarah, you must interrupt me because I feel like this is a, you know, a decade worth of work that I'm just about to explain. So I might get a bit lost in the weeds. And um, so PUP Speaks um, is uh, the Princeton University Press in-house speakers bureau. And what we're doing is combining the best of a speakers bureau with the best of a publishing house. And um, so it's unique in its focus. Uh, we're not just about making money. And we're also not just about the book. I'll come back to that in a second. That's important. Um, but essentially what we are about is championing academic authors as experts. Um, and PUP Speaks was the first of its kind for a university press. It's not the first of its kind for a publisher. Uh, so Penguin Random House very famously has a big speaking bureau. Um, and my understanding was there that um, they had all of these celebrity authors who couldn't understand why their publisher couldn't also be their PA. Um, and so they set up a speakers bureau because actually big authors want everything under one roof. Um, and that is something that we offer. It's a really great uh, opportunity to uh, not only represent our authors as speakers and represent their speaking careers, but also be able to provide all the services of the publisher in making sure that books are at the front and centre of lots of events. Um, so how we got here? Um, well, um, I was in discussion with Katie Hope, who's my manager and the director of marketing uh, at PEP for quite a few years. We'd worked together before at MIT Press. Um, and um, I had a few frustrations that PUP Speaks was the sort of eventual answer to. Um, the first of these was um, we never got enough time with our authors. Um, so um, as a publicist, you spend a lot of time getting to know an author and their book and their subject and their research. And you get really excited about it. And then six months to a year later, uh, you have to move on to a new set of authors um, and a new set of books and a new set of research. And um, even though uh, the book uh, that an author might have published might not be, you know, the big new bestseller of the season, the research behind it is still important and is changing all the time. And so um, it became increasingly clear to me that the research life um, of an academic well, well outspanned um, the book and that actually um, it, it was of, of benefit to us to keep supporting authors after the book um, had, you know, no longer um, a huge market left for it. Um, but how did we do that? Well, we, we couldn't just keep supporting uh, all of our authors forever, right? Much as we would love to. Um, and so we had to find a way uh, to do it that was sustainable. And that meant being a bit picky. Um, it meant only selecting those authors who had particularly active speaking lives. Um, and so that is... Um, one characteristic of PUP Speaks, we don't represent all of PUP authors by a long stretch. Um, we only have, uh, I think, sort of 25 people signed up at the moment, and that's not going to grow anytime soon. Um, and um, we are also um, quite picky about the type of book we work with. Um, there are sort of various criteria that we look for um, through, through sort of the research of the, um, the author. Um, and finally, um, it it meant that we um, had to find a way of monetizing events that weren't just about the book. Um, and that's why we take commission. So um, our authors speak um, for fees. Um, we calculate those fees, we negotiate those fees, and uh, we do all the billing and payment around those fees. And we take a 20% commission, which, it, which is very standard for a speaker's bureau. It's actually slightly on the lower end of things, but um, you know that, that's because we're not we're not in this for the money. We're in this to keep supporting our authors um, in a longer term way. And uh, to do that, uh, we had to find a way um, of championing events that weren't just about the book, uh, where the sales of the book alone uh, were not going to be enough to justify having another department. So that gives you sort of a, a bit of an idea of, of what we're doing. Um, I'm really excited. Um, I think it's amazing to be able to work with academics long term. Um, and I'm particularly excited because uh, we're having huge success. 
Um, and it did seem like a bit of a gamble when we first start the, started this off. It's a gamble I'm really glad we're taking. Um, I should say, um, and you know, this might be something we talk about later or another time. Um, it was very much at the center of our ENI initiatives at PUP. Uh, we have um, a real focus on equity and diversity. Um, and one of the opportunities we have with PUP Speaks is to champion authors who, for whatever reason, might not necessarily um, have as much uh, funding or as big a profile um, as we think they should have. So it's also an opportunity for us to really champion authors whose work we think is important and get their voices out there. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, just generally, you know, if there was one field or, or one type of work that you're more focused on, but we also have a question um, from Anna who says um, she's looking for a publisher I'm looking for a publisher for my hybrid memoir on our vanishing animal life, the epidemic and the loss of my son, all interconnected. Uh, it has poetry in it also. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, so I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, the kinds of projects that you, or the kind of work, I guess, in general, that you, um, you're interested in and that maybe translates better into this kind of uh, uh, program? Absolutely. Well, I should say to begin with, um, the uh, I was really surprised. So when um, me, me and Sarah actually talked about this about a week ago, I really thought that um, we'd be working primarily with economists and scientists. Uh, when I was um, a publicist, those were the authors that uh, seemed to take up the most time and the most media attention. What's actually been the case, and this will hopefully uh, be very good uh, for the SAR press community to hear, um, it's been the social scientists who have had by far the most success. Um, primarily the sociologists, we're having having um, a huge um, amount of interest in, um, but also um, anthropologists, uh, people who are working in politics and um, uh, economists as well. Um, and I, I was surprised by that, but in retrospect, I can see that there people are asking really big questions about the way our society is at the moment and um, people in the social sciences have the best tools to answer those. Um, so while we do have economists and uh, scientists on our list, the people who uh, tend to keep us the busiest are the social scientists, which is great. And then moving on to Anna's question, um, Anna, I can't uh, recommend a uh, publisher uh, specifically, but I would say your project sounds so interesting. And um, it immediately made me think a little bit of where the crawdad sings. Um, I don't know um, how many of you have read that book. Uh, it's actually a, a psychological thriller, but it has elements of poetry and ecology um, and uh, is a very sort of thoughtful and uh, interdisciplinary uh, novel. Um, and I know these sorts of interdisciplinary work and particularly sort of auto fiction are uh, extremely popular at the moment. So uh, good luck uh, in finding uh, a publisher uh, for what sounds like a really fascinating work. And um, it's always really good if there's a book with poetry in it to sort of build your presence online um, because that gives lots of opportunities uh, for people to engage with your work on an emotional level. Um, and that's a really good way for lots of um, poetry to get out there and get a good audience. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think thinking about work that's more interdisciplinary, you know, has different elements in it. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people are interested in that lately. You know, you don't, maybe you're not just writing sort of a straight up history of something, but it, it has poetry or, or memoir or other kind of reflective elements to it. Um, I think that's always potentially really interesting. Um, uh, we have another question from our director of scholar programs, Paul Ryer, and he says, Speaking as a scholar and author who did not get much publicity or support from my own academic press, PUP Speaks sounds like an amazing initiative. What sorts of venues are you finding for the social scientists you're working with and how do the economics work both for PUP and for the authors and speakers? Yeah, so Paul, I should start by saying, I'm sorry that you didn't get the support you should have had. Um, I know as a publicist, um, how often we feel like we're not doing quite right by our authors, um, just because uh, of the sheer um, scale of the list that we're working on. Um, and then there are also some times when um, you do all the work and just for whatever reason, a book that's really important or really interesting doesn't get the attention it deserves. Um, it's not an exact science. Um, and, and something that I've become increasingly aware of is how much uh, publicity is a partnership um, between the author and the, the publisher. Um, so um, publicity that used to be very much something that we did 
um, for our books and for our authors. And um, we'd also, you know, almost get a little bit annoyed uh, when authors started trying to get involved. Um, you know, that was when I started out in marketing and, and publicity about 10 years ago. Now, uh, we very much expect our authors to be involved. But but as publishers, it is our job to explain to our authors how they should be involved and how they can best be using their time. And I really see that as a responsibility of, of the publisher and of the, the marketing department, particularly that um, we are in a partnership, but we are the ones with the expertise that we need to explain um, and um, make clear how authors can be best using their time. Um, so, uh, Paul, to move on to your next question about the venues, um, there is a whole range of different uh, opportunities out there for academics. Uh, so a lot of the um, opportunities we're booking are still kind of broadly within the academic sphere and um, the academic conferences. Um, they are think tanks. Um, they are other universities or other departments and faculties um, that have a particular programme they're looking for speakers for. Um, there are also uh, corporations. Um, we do a lot of uh, events with sort of governments. I should say the economic side of that is not particularly profitable. Uh, I think the State Department has a pretty firm $500 limit uh, on honoraria, but uh, that is something we are happy to honour regardless uh, because we think that our governments and our decision makers need to hear from academics. Um, so, yeah, so that is... Um, what uh, um, the sort of range of places that we're working with um, how the economics work. Well, I mean, the economics from our perspective is that um, we have to make enough money to run a department. Um, and that I, I think it's probably fine for me to say on YouTube, we don't know if we're going to achieve that yet. Um, you know, we're less than six months in. It's looking, I'm, I'm feeling positive. Uh, there are some times when I look at the, I look at the numbers and I, I worry uh, whether we're going to make it uh, through the next three years uh, and come out um, in the black. But I, I'm pretty confident that we will. Um, but um, we also recognize there are huge benefits to the press of uh, supporting our authors as speaker long terms, not least in book sales. Of course, a lot of the events um, that we do organize do come with book sales in hand. And um, they come with, um, you know, bulk purchases or they come with selling books on the day. And regardless of whether um, there's books or sales involved, you know, in some physical form, um, there's always that promotion element. You're always putting your author out there. Um, there's always a discount code. There's always an opportunity opportunity um, for someone to buy the book and then and then also um, in you know uh, keeping our authors happy um, and keeping their profiles active is, is always going to benefit a, a publisher um, so that that's sort of one part of it um, you know in terms of um, how um, we negotiate fees that's quite a complex process I think that's probably um, the most uh, sort of um, inexact part of what we're doing um, I think we have a really clear idea of what uh, an academic's time is worth, and that will vary. Um, and it's a very personal thing as well. Um, there are lots of people who, uh, for reasons that aren't just how many years they've been on the tenure track, um, whose time um, is more valuable to them, um, whether that's because of family commitments or because of um, you know, roles that they have within their colleges. Um, and actually, they have to raise their fees just to make their lives viable. Um, and that's something we we support, even if it has a direct impact on the number of events they do. Um, so it's a, it's a very um, intimate relationship, actually, um, that we develop with a lot of our authors. Um, we uh, have lots of conversations about with them about what their aims are. <laughs> we um, have lots of uh, discussions with them about um, what they want out of the program. Um, and we work really hard to make sure that they are um, happy and that they're getting the, the best from us that we can give. Um, we also have expectations of them. Um, and the, the main one is that they be clear to us about what their aims are. And if they think that um, they can do better without us or we can uh, or they can sort of work on their own, then, then that's fine as well. Sorry, Paul, just... that's a very long answer to your question, but um, I'd love to talk more at some point. And, and please do come back to me if you've got further questions. That was great. Thank you. Um, and I just want to add that um, SAR Press has a, a list, sort of a resource list um, for authors on how to promote your book. It's, you know, mostly at a slightly smaller scale than the PUP program, but um, 
but still, you know, things that, that you can do as well. And I'm always trying to add to that. Um, so what kinds of engagements um, have your authors booked and, and what's been the response to those? I wonder if you could give me some examples. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one place that we're seeing a lot of interest is um, within sort of the extracurricular um, faculties of, of universities and colleges, um, where they might be looking for a particular expert in um, Indigenous studies or in a particular part of um, Black history, or where they might be celebrating a particular individual who might be from an LGBTQ background and want to have someone who can reflect on their experiences um, and um, uh, their area of research um, as a queer scholar um, and that you know that's kind of one area we get a lot of interest the other area is, is governments and political think tanks and that's particularly exciting to me because um I've always had a little bit of a concern that um, the people who uh, our decision makers listen to are not necessarily the people with the best information. Um, and actually, I think a lot of our academics do have the best information. Um, so I'm always really glad when we get a political body um, or a funding body or a charity or an organization that has a big impact on the world coming to us. Um, and, and requesting uh, an expert in a particular area. Um, that's really exciting to me. Um, and uh, an area that we're hoping to expand as well, um, and which we do have some traction in already, is sort of uh, big businesses, uh, their sort of annual uh, conferences or meetings or training days and things like that. Um, we do get quite a few banks um, and investment groups getting in touch and asking for speakers. Um, that obviously means that our speakers also have to be good. They can't just be interesting. They can't just have important things to say. Uh, they have to be able to keep uh, a room of people um, who uh, know that they could be at their laptops interested. Um, and that is actually a part of our training that I haven't um talked about yet is we, we do offer coaching for all of our speakers um, about how to present themselves and um, particularly we offer sort of a profile analysis um, of all of our audience as, as well so we make them we make sure that they know who they're speaking to and, and what sort of things to cover in advance. Oh wow that's super interesting that's such a good idea. Um, I wonder if you uh, can talk about what kinds of um, tangible or intangible effects you think the program has had um, that you know you've noticed or maybe the authors have brought up? Yeah, I think um, the most encouraging thing to me is um, that we've made some of our authors' lives a lot better. Um, so um, this is um, you know requires a bit of background, but another reason that I was really keen to set up. Um, PUP Speaks is um, to support some of our authors who find themselves torn in a million different directions. Um, and often that's women. Um, so a lot of um, female academics um, and, women, and female professionals in general find that um, because there is a, a really positive drive towards having women speaking and having sort of 50-50 representation at conferences and on panels, um, but there's not a 50-50 split within the academy yet, we're working on it. Um, actually, um, uh, women often find that they're overloaded uh, with invitations. Um, so um, I won't name them, but I have a couple of speakers who probably get uh, three or four invitations a week um, and often those are three or four invitations to travel internationally um, and of course there's no way that they can make uh, positive answers to those invitations it's just not possible so not only do we help them prioritize think about their aims work out um, which events are going to work for them help with their scheduling we also take off a huge amount of burden of things like following up for payment, um, which is, is enormously time consuming. Um, so um, the ideal situation is that um, we get an invitation or our speaker gets an invitation and passes it on to us. And the next thing they hear from us is we've booked their flights, uh, we're giving them an audience profile um, and they can just sit back and, and concentrate with uh, putting on a talk that's really fantastic. Um. Do you have any thoughts about uh, self-publishing? I do. I think self-publishing is brilliant. I think it works better for some genres than others. And um, poetry actually is a really good example of that. Um, I think um, poetry um, probably still has, um, while it is, you know, 
vitally much more professionalized now and that's a really great thing that people are recognizing that area of the arts and um, it has a bit of a sort of um avant-garde uh history to it that means that uh you know uh, people will always want to go their own way and, and have their own freedom and voice themselves in in their own uh in their own terms and that often means having to not involve publishers um who are you know from the slightly boring corporate world um and so self-publishing is in poetry um I think can be particularly fruitful. There are lots of areas. And um, in academia, it's not something I think um, sort of um, probably rightly that happens an awful lot. I'm not saying that it shouldn't happen at all. And obviously that is because of the peer review process um, and that being a really important part of academic publishing. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think um, small presses and indie presses are becoming increasingly impactful. That's another thing. It's not quite self-publishing, but it's uh, not going to, you know, the big guys and um, and saying that you can have my work and you don't have to feel like you're selling your soul as much. I think indie publishers are often much happier to take risks um, and um, uh, you know that that's a really great thing we need we need diversity within publishing um, because otherwise we end up with sort of the music industry model don't we of of you know uh, big publishers taking on a thousand books and one making them all the money and then they just ignore the rest um, and then you end up in Paul's situation of you know calling your publicist and finding out they haven't done anything for your book because uh, they're too busy working with you know Oprah Winfrey or someone else uh, who's taking all the time <laughs> um, earlier you mentioned um, diversity and equity and how you know this you feel like this program is is supporting some of that work um, do you feel like you again you know do you feel like you see um, effects results um, you know how would you say that that this kind of program is making a, a difference yeah, that's such a good question, Sarah. I mean, I should say we are still really early on. Um, so we launched on the 1st of June, which was not that long ago. Although as I look out at the like dark London sky and my rain washed windows, it feels like it was quite a while ago. Um, so um, one example, um, we have been working really closely with one um, scholar who writes about food poverty um, in African-American communities. Um, he is relatively early career. Um, he's young, he's dynamic, he's funny. Um, he is um, a sociologist um, writing um, on an area where um, there might not be a huge amount of, of funding. Um, and so we are helping him champion his book and get out there and get on the road. And um, we have been able to organize a sort of full tour for him. Now, one thing I should say, and I, I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but um, every, every time... Um, we see an example of the books not making the event. I feel more excited about what we're doing because um, when you've worked in publishing for a long time, um, you will know there is nothing more demoralizing than the books just not turning up. Um, whether that be physically at an event, whether that be um, in time for that big media push that you carefully planned, um, it's particularly the case at the moment. Uh, I'm sure uh, Sarah has been in a lot of meetings, as I have, about the current uh, paper crisis and how that is affecting all of our uh, printing plans and all our PNI and um, how books are getting pushed out months and months later than they were meant to. And it's all a bit of a mess. The great thing about um, our model is that we the book does not have to be sold for us to make it viable. Now, we always want the book to be there. The book should be front and center. We are publishers. We care about books. We think they are the best way of disseminating knowledge. But actually, if the book isn't there or if the field has moved on from the book, or for whatever reason, the audience isn't interested in the book because they're interested in a very specific area of it. And so they don't want to buy the whole thing. We can still champion our authors. Um, and that's really, really important. Um, so um, that, you know, part, that's part of um, what we're doing. And it, it also means that we can do things like support an author tour that might go virtual. Um, we can put time into planning a series of events that in sort of traditional publishing models would have been a failure. Um, because as everyone knows, you know, um, if you have a audience of 400 in a room, you might sell 40 books. If you have an audience of 400 on Zoom, you'll be lucky if you sell one. Um, so 
Um, it, it, it's very important to me that we make our work sustainable um, and that we find ways for championing our authors as speakers and as academics outside of the book. Um, and one of the ways um, that PUP speaks allows to that is by um, asking for fees um, and for travel support. Um, and, that, and that also, by dint of, of providing funding, allows people who wouldn't normally be able to do that sort of work on their university funding. Um, so we're sort of doing the work of a, a fund raiser as well um alongside um you know we're championing authors um as uh people worth paying for as well um and and working out kind of the logistics of that um which is lots of fun when i was a publicist author tours were my favorite thing um about my job so as you can imagine <laughs> absolutely loving having it basically my full-time uh focus <laughs> that's brilliant authors are and scholars are people worth paying for that's great yeah. um uh, I was going to ask, uh, you, you've mentioned a couple times going beyond the book. Um, do you currently or have plans to, you know, expand into any other kinds of media or, or are you still going to focus on uh, speaking books and the, spe and the speakers? Yeah, that's a really good question, Sarah. I mean, um, PUP has always been um, very keen at, at championing new ways of, of um, getting information across. Um, so um, I, this is obviously aside from what I do, um, but they um, have their own audio um, business. They also have um, a um, an ideas magazine that they run. Um, they also do a lot of um, sort of industry initiatives. Um, I haven't, to my shame, I haven't called out um, AUP yet. Um, who are the reason that we're all, you know, we're all here together. Um, they are fantastic. And if, if any of you are looking for resources, um, their website is just an absolute treasure trove of information. Um, I always think um, that, you know, it's sort of the, the unsung hero of the academic world and the um, academic um, university, uh, university press organization, because they just, um, so I should say it's the Association of University Presses. Um, but the fact that, you know, they uh, get us all together and get us talking about the best ways to do our job um, is amazing. Um, because, you know, I, Sarah, I think it's kind of fair to say we're the underdogs, aren't we? We're like the scrappy uh, purists who uh, really, you know, we're representing everything that's like good and important and vital and needs to be discussed. Um, but it is hard sometimes for us to take risks in the way that a, a big publisher would. Um, I remember um, going to the London Book Fair, uh, which is the, the equivalent of sort of Book Expo America here in London. Um, and, um, and they would always have a, a, a sort of seminar where a publicist from Penguin would get up and say about all the cool new stuff they were doing. And they were running like club nights and abandoned warehouses for a book about <laughs> Jazz Age. And we were like, this sounds great, but like, we don't have a budget. Um, and my, my least favorite of those events is when um, the person running Michelle Obama's book tour in the UK got up and was talking about booking out stadiums. And I was like, I can't fill a bookshop for most of my authors. What are you doing? Um, and actually that, you know, sort of leads me on to saying, um, part a really important part of what we do um, with PUP Speaks is actually essentially grassroots marketing. And, and grassroots marketing is something that um, academic presses are extremely good at and that no one really appreciates. Um, so I've worked in academic presses, but I, I've normally been on sort of the, the trade side of things. And it's only because I started out in medicine books marketing um, that I understood that there is something valuable about going around in a car on people's, you know, heading up on people's campuses with textbooks and talking to professors. Um, and that's an amazing part of what we do, but it's, it's not a particularly glamorous part of what we do and it's hard work. And a, a big part of what we do with PUP Speaks is essentially that grassroots marketing and um, mm -hmm. searching out uh, academics and uh, telling them about a new book and asking if they want someone on their campus and uh, working out the logistics, uh, both the financial logistics and um, the um you know, sort of capacity logistics of, of doing that. Um, so yeah, grassroots marketing is also very important and, and something that I think that's where we'll grow when we grow. Um, it'll be finding new ways to reach audiences sort of on the ground level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that outreach is incredibly important um, and challenging. 
Um, so Paul is asking uh, now about TED Talks, um, which have sort of sucked up a lot of the oxygen in the public speaking world. Um, so to what extent have you had to orient yourselves in relation to TED Talks? And, you know, are, are you, who are you competing with? How do you compete with them? Yeah. Um, so Paul, um, I've resisted mentioning TED Talks so far in this seminar. I normally use them as an example of what we're not doing. Um, and um, I think that I, TED Talks is great, right? Like who hasn't um, used a very valuable uh, work break uh, watching someone talking about, you know, getting out of a cult or um, sort of repeating the same three thought experiments from the 1980s over and over again. Like they're great, they're great, they're great entertainment. Then they're, they're, they're rarely uh, useful in my opinion. Um, and um, I, I have met the founder um, of them and had this discussion with him. So I think I'm allowed to say it publicly. Um, I think the problem with TED Talks, right, is that they're entertainment. They're not information. In 14 minutes, you cannot do justice to a topic. And the people who are doing it and, you know, they are they, they might be hugely inspiring. I have wept in TED Talks. Some of our speakers have done TED Talks that I have watched with my mouth agape, the way that they've um, formed stories from their lives and woven them into their research. They are extremely impressive. But something that I really want our audiences to get out of our talks is um, a piece of information that they will then go on to apply to their lives and their work that will make a difference to the world. Um, and I don't think TED Talks manage that. And uh, one of the reasons for that is often the information that they um, share is, is not the most correct or the most nuanced or the most up to date. Um, the other example of that I always think is the like Harvard Business School guy doing five reasons AI is going to change creativity on something like that, as if we haven't all heard that talk a thousand times. And when something is so broad, um, you can't use it. It's not useful. Um, so anyway, um, there's something wonderful about the way academics um, uh, niche enough that they um, have uh, practical information. Um, we often think that sort of academia, the ivory tower, it's all lofty, it's not useful, but um, we are dealing with people who um, have the specifics that allow you to make a decision. Um, you know, that's that's why governments need economists, isn't it? It's because a government can't look out at, you know, um, the problems in their community and, and sort of guess. We need the people who have got the numbers there and know how to use them. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, I think TED Talks are great if you want to waste a few hours on a plane. Um, they're less useful if you want to change your change your life in the world. Um, so if you had to tell an author just just one thing or just a couple of things that, um, that they could do, you know, to promote their book, promote their work, um, get out there, um, talk to more people, what, what would that be? Yeah. So the number one thing would be um, work with your publisher. Um, and um, I should say there, there will be times when the publisher doesn't play ball and that's disappointing and we will get to that next. But work with your publisher and ask them what you can do um, because um, publishers are, are often stretched. And I think um, unfairly we'll see authors who are invested as potentially difficult or needy, which is very rarely the case in my experience. You do get, um, you know, people are difficult, aren't they? But um, I, I've rarely found authors to be difficult. I think they're just invested. Um, and that means actually you can have a frank conversation with them about the most useful work they can be doing. Um, and that might be something like um, thinking of conferences they were at and providing really useful in-depth information about that. Uh, it might be telling their academic colleagues. Uh, it might be uh, remembering that they do a lot of speaking events and that that's an opportunity to promote their book. Um, it might be giving um, publishers lots of warning. Um, it might be writing. Um, it might be uh, doing media. It might be engaging with their uh, university um, press office and getting them involved. It might be asking favours. Um, there are there are lots of ways, but I think if you go to your publisher and ask what you can do, they should give you um, a job to do and, and maybe several. Um, and um, if your publisher is not helpful, 
that's a real shame. I think you can do a lot on your own, um, but I understand that that's a struggle. Um, talking to other authors about what they did that worked is, is often really helpful, particularly if you've got people in your department who have had successful books. Um, I think um, also um, looking on things like the AUP website um, and following their advice is really helpful. Um, very rarely do I recommend that um, academic authors do things like hire a, an, an external publicist because, um, you know, I, I just think it's never, um, isn't, it's, it's a lot of money and might not be effective. Um, but I think you can champion a lot of your um, own work. Again, on, on the grassroots level, tell your colleagues about it, ask them who they know who might be able to present it. Um, set up your own event and get your campus bookstore to come. You should receive help from your publisher in that, um, but failing that, uh, thinking where you see books is always helpful and then try and get your book there. Yeah, and I maybe you mentioned this earlier, but um, the I think it's called Ask UP. The Ask UP website is yeah. just full of information about, I mean, all kinds of things, you know, including uh, book promotion and, and why it's so important, you know, why it's not something you should be like shy of or embarrassed about. It's just, it's, you know, really important work that, that every author should be thinking about. Um, this has been lovely. Um, I would like to uh, give a huge thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, anyone who donated to support this event, to you, Katie, thank you. Um, to the staff at SAR who made this all possible. I just want to say thank you again, and we will see you next time. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Bye. Bye.